Welcome to Poems On. I'm Al Basil, and this is the second show of the second season. Um, my guests today are Jane Satterfield and Ned Balbo, Jane being a new guest and Ned being a returning guest. And our theme today is characters. So Jane, if you will begin things, please. Thanks, Al. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us um, join you today. Um, in honor of um, International Women's Day, I thought I'd read a few poems um, about um, from a new manuscript that's about the Bronte sisters. Um, okay. And this poem um, introduces, imagines, I should say, the Brontes as um, contemporary superheroes um, in some ways. The there's a um, truism in biography that each generation kind of um, imagines um, a, subjects um, in the way that reflects the interests of their times. So this is an attempt to um, bring the Brontes even more up to date than they already were. So this is called the Badass Brontes. The Badass Brontes are up to here with Ant's old time religion, their brother's bruisey brawls. They'll walk miles in unhip boots, unfazed by hail or funnel clouds, slinging sweet iambics to help them keep the pace. Anne's irked past words with nannying and given in her notice, good riddance to the coked up financier and his straying wife, the schoolboy stoning sparrows, the chronic cleaning up. She's breathing freer now, a gothic cross heaves between her breasts. Some nights she leads kitchen karaoke, is not above canoodling in the crypts with her father's curate. Charlotte downs a dirty chai to plot another romance novel. She'll cook the books and justify her genius, rifling through her sister's desks. She's no ordinary busybody, just looking for a pen. Her love letters to her old prof are full of pretty filthy stuff, submissive dreams and words like whips. Emily's an insomniac, works from dusk till dawn, and still finds time for pistol practice, survivalism calls. When hailed to play piano, she'll unleash a dark feud on unwitting guests and call her hawk down with a whistle. Watch out, she'll throw red wine in your face. Beguiling cocktails, they can't even. Their laughter sets the house abuzz as any hive. They go commando when they can in town or on the primrose path. Thank you. So there's some truth in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was going to be my question was, um, first of all, you've got to know a lot about them to know what you can bring to the present from the way they were in the past. And that would be my question is, how do you what did you translate? What did you bring with you? I mean, you're using modern, modern expressions and modern imagery. Right. And it sounds, it feels very apt, but I don't know the Brontes like you do. <laughs> well, <laughs> I will add a caveat that I am, you know, a poet, not a literary scholar. So I'm sure, um, you know, and, and I haven't, I think for me, the, the biography that is um, really helpful, if you want to know more about the Brontes, is Juliet Barker's um, biography. She was the librarian at, the, at Howard Parsonage, um, which is their home, which is now a museum. Um, and she's done incredible work. Um, you know, in archives and, and so on to, to really bring the whole family and their history um, to life and in context um, with the historical issues of, of the time. Um, so I think that probably, I mean, um, you know, uh, the three sisters, the idea of the three sisters as um, women who were in some ways isolated because um, their father's a curate um, in a small industrial town. And so they can't like kind of mix with your average person um, because of that. At the same time, um, you know, their, their father's perpetual curacy position was not in incredibly luc lucrative. So 
and his family hailed from Ireland. Um, he had gone to Cambridge on scholarship. Um, so they were kind of like upwardly mobile in the um, way that, that people do when they are, um, they have a great intellectual passion, but you know, they, they face the dilemma of having to support themselves. Um, and so um, they were very unhappy um, in their work as teachers and their work as, um, um uh in in their uh, other work i'm trying to remember the name of you so you're gonna have to cut this out the um other <laughs> governess that's the term um in in work is governess um so you know i think that they um they kind of stand as the example of women who were independent ambitious um but who by virtue of being in the victorian era had very strict um you know um, uh, rules on what they could and couldn't do and, and uh, sort of squash their ambition. So I think that um, in some ways, I imagine them uh, much more um, contemporary than uh, probably they were really were. But there's truth that Emily learned to fire a pistol. Um, her father taught her to uh, shoot a pistol. Um, he kept a pistol on hand because uh, he had heard about the Luddite rebellions in Yorkshire and was concerned um, about the family's safety. Um, Charlotte did um, fall in love with a former professor and did write letters that were um, uh, very uh, expressive um, for her era of her of her fascination and and love for for this married professor. Um, and then Anne um, did have there is some sense that Anne did have um, some romantic feelings, although she did not necessarily act on them for her father's curate. So and she was also somebody who was um, uh, extremely pious. Um, so those elements are true. Um, so I think I, I've kind of like embellished them and imagined um, what they would be like if they were um, in our era. Um, however, I didn't get to Twitter with the Brontes. So. <laughs> it sounds to me like you let them, you set them free in a way that they might have been set free in the modern era, but that was consistent with who they were in spirit in yeah. their era. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, an, another element of truth is that Emily did have a hawk. She was a sort of, you know, occasional oh, wildlife rescuer. They were very fond of animals and she did rescue a hawk um, and, his, and did a beautiful drawing of her hawk Nero. Well, I imagine a series of uh, dreams in which the sisters appear to you and congratulate you on what you've done with them. <laughs> Well, that would be lovely. <laughs> I can't write them, but perhaps someone will. <laughs> well, Ned, you, you've the way has been made for you. <laughs> this is a sonnet. It's called "The Invisible Man's Escape," after James Whale's 1933 classic uh, film, which uh, used to be easily available on late night horror television on WPIX in the New York area. Oh yeah. And uh, now uh, is available elsewhere. I'll leave it to you to find it. And in this scene, the invisible man is uh, 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 revealing himself, but of course being invisible, there's only so much to reveal. The invisible man's escape. In that long moment, knowing the police were near, the inn's proprietor still bleeding from the push downstairs, my face still bandaged, black sunglasses on, equipment damaged, hope dashed, patrons risen at the noise to call for my arrest, I felt a speeding, sick sensation. Mirrored in those eyes, now black voids, was the answer was the way back that I'd sought and lost, the broken piece I'd missed or thought mere accident, a stray thread dangling carelessly. Worse was to know my one escape was to unravel now the gauze that gave me form to feel, not fear, but only certainty that nothing's there. 
So you have put yourself quite deeply in the place of this guy. Well, it's also a poem about impostorship and identity. Um, it's in a book, uh, The Trials of Edgar Poe and Other Poems, which is available in battered used form on Amazon um, for either $3 or $2 or $2,000, because we've all as poets <laughs> seen those wildly excessive prices posted for books that you wonder whether anyone ever buys at all. And of course, the answer is not when it's that expensive. No, um, but the heart leaps just a little. <laughs> yes, the heart leaps the heart, or the heart sinks. I think it sinks more than it leaps. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, so it is also uh, from a book that's about adoption and identity. I'm an adopted person and, and uh, that sense of who you are and, and, and uh, what lies at your core is certainly uh, an issue uh, that adopted folks face and ask about. Uh, sure. when they look back at themselves and consider who they are. Wow. Very apt then. Um, I don't think you intended this as a natural segue for me, but actually speaking about identity is a very nice lead into the, the poem that I'm going to read first, which has to do with my own identity and how I viewed it and how it was viewed by others. So we've gone from, um, from Jane reimagining characters who live, but not in our time, to your inhabiting an imaginary character in a, in a real way, to, um, to a true story that happened uh, pretty much exactly as I tell it um, a long time ago in what my grandparents used to call the old country. <laughs> it's called Ancient Roman 1972. Mm -hmm. And this, this did take place during a trip that I made to Italy. And it did take place on a Roman street in the summer of 1972. Ancient Roman 1972. Dressed in the black of my Sicilian aunts, imperious as 85 can be, she sat in an eternal city haunt warm to the task of educating me. I'm purebred Roman, we go back, she said fiercely, 2,000 years, unbroken line, my family. Pride held up her ancient head. Her voice was thin, but certain. In the time of emperors, she sat back, satisfied, and peered up at me, looking like a local, but speaking like La America. Mm -hmm. She tried to gauge my worth, my lineage, the focal point. And you, where were your people from? She slyly asked and turned a practiced eye to stare up as I squinted from the sun full on my face. Awaiting my reply, she sat, a judge, complacent in the shade. My father was Brutzesa near Calderone. My mother was Sicilian, wrinkled up a grin. Ah, minestrone. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Sicilians are not highly regarded by Romans. And so I was lucky to be able to attain the level of soup. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that she has such pride in being Roman. Uh, it makes me think, of course, uh, the, uh, of the series that Jane and I are watching for amusement in the evenings, which is called Britannia, <laughs> which is a wildly psychedelic and fantastical reinvention of the invasion and, and, and occupation of Britannia by the ancient Romans. Um, wow. So, uh, so, so I'll consider that part of her, her uh, lineage as well. Uh, <laughs> dictatorial murdering, executing Romans with a, with a <laughs> penchant for, for killing Celts. Oh, she had the some of that sand hearing. in her. I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, um, no great depth there, but um, but that is how I was regarded. And uh, now I'm closer to her age, and uh, uh, I'm not sure I'd refer to anybody quite as Minestrone, but you know. It, it doesn't sound like a compliment. <laughs> I wasn't intended to be one as I <laughs> as I took it, but you know, she was she was uh, 
she was a an old woman worthy of my respect if mm. if if not it, 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 even though that wasn't necessarily a mutual feeling <laughs> well you just have to be zen about it al <laughs> wow <laughs> oh that's great i don't know if it'll print through if you were it, it, it was only on the screen while you were talking but boy that was great <laughs> put it back and talk a little bit oh that's terrific <laughs> there he is yeah the Buddha. The Buddha of why Suburbia. Is, yeah, why? Of course, it's a cat. I, I should have known that from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep it rolling here. Um, you have at least another Bronte poem, Jane. I don't know if you're going to stay in, in the family or, uh, or venture for. Uh, yeah. Um, since you mentioned um, uh, that, I'll read a, a poem that was suggested by internet quizzes. Um, the Brontes have a long um, afterlife, not just in literary culture, um, but also in popular culture. They're tremendously popular, the movies and comics and performances, um, stage productions and so on, um, as well as memes <laughs> and internet quizzes are, are just all sort of testaments to um, the way that they speak to people beyond um, the, the time period in which they lived. And um, I was struck by internet quizzes because they kind of like you run through a series of questions and then they align your answers with um, one of the sisters profiles. Um, and so um, in order to explore that, I wanted to use some of the language of the quizzes, and I decided to work with um, the triolet. And so that meant eight lines, um, an eight line poem of two rhymes. The first line is repeated as the fourth and seventh line, and then the second line becomes the eighth line. So there are three triolets, one for each of the three sisters, and again, they're suggested by internet quizzes. Um, and this is called, Which Bronte Sister Are You? You're just like Emily, quiet and courageous. You don't need any man to speak for you. What secrets are you holding? Let them guess. Like Emily, you are quietly courageous, unfazed by ghosts or storms, mysterious. Your eye is drawn to creatures deemed past rescue. A free spirit in a vintage dress, you burn, courageous, untouched by any man who speaks to you. Your plainness can't disguise the fact that you're ambitious, like duty-bound Charlotte hoping for romance. The rakes you can't reform prove you're rebellious. You can't disguise your pain. Still, you're ambitious to pen a stellar tale that tantalizes men who envy your prose and cash advance. It's plain, you can't disguise it. You're ambitious, despite your facade of duty, hope, romance. Sidelined by show-offs, you're gentle with a steely core. You're reserved like Anne, intelligent and reflective. You live your life as if touched by a higher power. Your pen is a weapon, you're steely at the core. Confronting the justice you deplore, you fight to the bitter end. And you forgive your show-off siblings, though you do keep score, however reserved, well-mannered, and reflective. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was sort of fun to capture their, um, their, the sort of essence as, of the sisters as we see them, but also give a little nod to their, um, what uh, the sort of sibling rivalry that I think any, any group of sisters would have felt. And of course, I do not have sisters. Um, so I think in some ways, that's part of my um, admiration um, for, for these women and the, and the, the sort of intellectual um, bonds that they forged in their sisters sisterhood. Does history record any rake ever being reformed? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, of course, you know, the, the, um, you know, the uh, Mr. Rochester is an example of the famous um, rake um, that that Charlotte wrote about. And of course, um, you know, there's a great film 
um, a TV adaptation by Robert Young from, I think, 1997, um, where Rochester is played by the magnificent Kieran Hans. I think he does this amazing job of capturing um, the sort of rake who won't be reformed, but he's also, um, in some ways, emotionally vulnerable. Um, even though he's in, in the book, he's actually very creepily controlling um, in some ways of, um, of Jane, the governess. Um, and then uh, Samantha Morton is the, the actor who plays um, Jane Eyre in that production. I think she just does an amazing job of, of capturing, um, you know, Jane Eyre's um, ambition and steeliness and also her, her deep driven um, desire for, um, for passion and, and her admiration for um, an uh, appreciation for the natural world as well. She, it's, Jane's a very complex character and I think her performance is quite extraordinary. I, I imagine that a rape with the vulnerable side would be catnip to the <laughs> multitudes. What's that, Ned? <laughs> I, I've, I've found that to be the case. <laughs> and, and, and of course, in terms of reforming, Jane's too modest. I mean, Jane, you know, you did it with me. <laughs> there you go. And there's a there's a hilarious um, cartoon, um, which is it has circulated on the Internet. Um, that's like um, uh, of the three sisters. And um, it's like dude watching with the Brontes and um, you know, Anne is sort of in this cartoon, Anne is sort of making fun of the characters of Heathcliff that Emily creates and the rake of Rochester um, and the way in which these are extremely toxic <laughs> men. So it's interesting how many, um, you know, how much life they have, um, you know, beyond, beyond their time and beyond their literary creations, they, they speak so vividly um, to um, our imagination. Well, we've attained a point in the culture where we're open to what they were in ways that we, that we weren't 50 years ago. So they're coming into their own uh, again, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sir, yes, the, 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 the reformed version. I, I'm sorry I didn't get to see the pre Reformation version of Ned. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, you don't know, you want to have known that <laughs> those college days are long gone. <laughs> Maybe it was middle school, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, hey, uh, this poem, um has a little bit of a note. High strangeness. J. Allen Hynek's words appear in UFOs, A Scientific Debate, edited by Carl Sagan and Thornton Page. And there's also a, a widely shared diagram, commonly reported UFO types, which you'll find online. Now, this is a poem in which the speaker is actually uh, uh, the uh, supervisor of a character he's speaking to. And what this character he's speaking to has to do is go out and interview folks who've been mm. abducted by UFOs and uh, have had that, you know, that, well, it's pretty much a universal experience, isn't it? We've all been abducted by a UFO <laughs> at one time or another. And part of this is to gather information and to, and to uh, correlate facts and, uh, and to also look past uh, mass hallucination and delusion. Um, and to try to figure out if there is any truth to it, or perhaps it's really just a kind of modern day folktale collecting. Mm. Um, and uh, the poem is called High Strangeness. And that's because um, that's a term uh, in UFO encounters. And I'll read that quick note, which is the epigraph under the title, High Strangeness. The degree of strangeness is certainly one aspect of a filtered UFO report. The higher the strangeness index, the more the information aspects of the report defy explanation. In short, did the strange thing really happen? <laughs> so high strangeness. The Saturn disc reported back in 54, ringed sphere against the sky, was not the first recorded, nor do we know why it hovered for an hour then vanished like a ghost into upwelling dust. It was, we knew at once, 
extraterrestrial, before and ever since, far-flung celestial unearthly craft and shapes compressed or spherical surveil us by night. Triangular teardrops that shed a greenish light eyewitnesses recall still shocked by their encounters through space or time or both tracked down against their will. Your jobs to calm their fears and coax out every detail. Place no one under oath. They may be sensitive. Persons whose faith is challenged by the very concept, their world upended, changed by truths they can't accept or with a wave disprove. When they describe abduction from farms in Minnesota, crop circles and burnt embers, their missing son or daughter, lured in some seduction no one quite remembers, unprodded, nod your head and take notes, copious notes. They may recount instead the raising of a wand that scattered sheep and goats, the silvery gloved hand whose touch could paralyze a witness or stop time. Charred metal, shards of glass are clues to analyze if we can gather some before they're lost. And yes, a few will speak of cakes unsalted on their tongues, mm -hmm. offered as nourishment or recompense for wrongs by strangers strangely silent who cover up their tracks, galactic travelers who let their lives touch ours while sojourning on earth. The stories may be true, though cakes appear too in folk and fairy myth, where those who dare to taste such food endure a spell that robs them of their past, all memory erased, which does explain at least how much they cannot tell. <laughs> Sorry for saying sheeps. It should have been sheep. I know you don't say sheeps, but you know, well, we mean, have glitches. This is a live performance, man. You can. This is live. <laughs> Warts and all. Imagine the. I'm I sorry. Go the ahead. There's that parallel between the, um, you know, the fairy stories and the, um, the, um, UFO abductions and imagination and the way that um, is sketched out so so beautifully in that poem. Well, yeah, it's really interesting the way uh, the uh, archetypes of myth find their way reinvented and reconfigured as time moves on and culture moves forward. So you know you know we need uh, 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 we need these things to happen on some very deep level, or perhaps there's just some common strand in the unconscious that causes us. To, to think of these things and, and, to, and to, on some level, long for them in this kind oh, of yeah. fantasy of, well, perhaps it's not a fantasy. Perhaps mm -hmm. I do believe in alien abduction. Well, the, the, out of the many of the Joseph Campbell books about myth, the uh, Myths to Live By uh, addresses the question of finding newly minted mythical structures mm -hmm. that satisfy the needs that mm -hmm the old myths did for people in other times, acknowledging that the need itself has not really changed, but that the structures uh, have a life arc of their own. And that just as religions in, have an arc where they're, where they're popular and then, and then they may die out, uh, mm -hmm. we're at the point where we need new, uh, new myths. And Campbell lived long enough to see uh, Star Wars, and he thought that that was a great example of a mm -hmm. modern attempt to recast um, the the demands of the subconscious. Mm -hmm. In you know, and well, so far both of your poems actually, Ned, have have, have struck this sort of popular uh, popular culture and and uh, popular awareness of the the nature of otherness, the nature of the other. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which, by being around the other, we confirm our sense of ourselves in terms of where there's resonance and where there's difference. So any kind of conscious creatures are always going to be capable 
of engaging in those kinds of dynamics. So, yeah, neat. I love um, how you put that. That's that's so well put. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's, it just so happens that those two poems of yours speak speak consistently to that, um, and you happen to read them in in or you know in a sequence. I think your other ones are, are a little different, but it struck me because I heard them back to back that way. I thought they were identical, all of them pretty much the same. Just like <laughs> mine in the same old vein over and over. <laughs> now, if you'll, permit, if you'll permit me to say so, you might, but that doesn't mean we have to. <laughs> um, however, uh, I'm being consistent in that my next poem is again about a, a specific real character, in this case, my mother's father, my maternal grandfather, who was alive until I was in my early 20s and who had a huge influence on me. Um, is and, this in your um, beautiful book, Solos? Actually, um, this one is in Tonesmith, which was the one before Solos. But thank you for, uh, thanks for the, for the plug. <laughs> yeah, do you have it within reach? Maybe you should. Hold I do. It up. Yeah, in fact, I have. This is that's the new one. Mm -hmm. That's solos. That's from this 100 year. One hundred amazing poems. Um, Tom Smith, which was from three years before, is another hundred poems, and it's from that book that this poem comes. But in fact, I've written about my grandfather uh, many times, and I have poems about him in each of my books so far. So this is called uh, with a nod to. Um, talk about popular culture. This is called Straight Out of Antiquity, which is uh, not Compton. <laughs> <laughs> Straight Out of Antiquity. It's for Sal Salvatore mm -hmm. Raiti, uh, 1895 to 1971. He was my mother's father. And he taught me many things. Which see? Straight Out of Antiquity. With one five foot length of line designed for hanging clothes. He made the ancient weapon. Mm -hmm. Four knots, an S curve and a finger loop were all he used. He took me to a field, found some egg sized stones and showed me how to cradle one, then set it spinning out at arm's length overhead until the whir pitched up, then the wrist snap and the letting go, the stone straight, true to my intentions. A shepherd boy in Sicily, he kept the wolves at distance. Over here, he cut out leather soles and cobbled on the last, illiterate till 40, learning then Italian, never English. Proud to read, he savored every word in the Italian paper when it came each week. Through him, my line comes straight out of antiquity. But up until him, all unread, unwritten. He launched me far into this field of letters, not here by accident. I'll use my sling, spin out a taut line singing in the air, snap off a point bound right between your eyes. I love that. That's great. When uh, <clears throat> I learned well enough as a boy that when I was uh, teaching uh, years later in uh, high school, in private high school, um, I would, every once a year I would take uh, my English class out behind the building where there was a big field. Mm -hmm. And I'd take a, a length of clothesline and I would make one of these slings. Uh -huh. And I would bring some stones out there and I'd Mm -hmm. I'd show them how David slew Goliath. That's amazing. That's great. <laughs> That's amazing. I also feel it would be a very good uh, disciplinary trick as well. Uh, uh, perhaps better better used as a threat than, than an action. Well, in fact, I always did that in the spring semester. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wasn't trying to establish. If I, hadn't, if I hadn't won them over by that point, threats <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have helped. But um. But they thought it was great fun. And, and I often wondered whether any of them tried to do the same because literally all you needed was about six feet of clothesline. Mm -hmm. You didn't need leather. You didn't need, all you needed was a piece of clothesline and uh, which you, 
you put knots in and then you made an S curve and put knots in it to create a kind of a three stranded pouch. Mm. And you would put the stone in there and you had to know how to set it up and cradle it. And um, it was, you know, it was a, it didn't have a lot of currency in modern life, but it worked great with 15 year olds. <laughs> uh, I love the portrait of your grandfather too. Uh, it's it's wonderful to to have all those details come to life and that portrait of another time and, and a, another way of life when 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 mm -hmm. you know folks from a very different background you know could be you know cobblers and shoemakers and you know in a, a, a type of America that is quickly fading. Yeah, I have a lot of poems about uh, about that particular grandparent, about both both of those grandparents. In, in fact. Um, I write a lot about my childhood and, and the characters from my childhood. So having a character's theme was a natural one for me to come up with because mm -hmm. I have a lot of a lot of things I can pick from. So, um, well, great. Yeah, I, I, I valued all of that. But I particularly like the fact that um, I didn't come from a line of scholars. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even come from a line of readers. Um, yeah, neither did I. Yeah, I mean, literally, my grandfather could not read or write Italian until the age of 40. And so uh, it makes you feel very, um, makes you feel a little like a mushroom, you know, you sort of sprouted up fast mm -hmm. overnight out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, enough of the Sicilian grandparents. Jane, please. No, I think that's, I, I, I love that. Um... Uh, that is such a creative that in that poem, Al, it's such a creative way of dealing with the eternal teacher question. Can we have class outside? <laughs> you know, you got uh, it exactly. That's exactly what I would right. say. Well, we ha we have to wait until until the ground is is dry out in exactly. the back of the building. And yeah. so they were they were patient because they knew there was something coming. Yeah, so, yeah, of course, exactly. when you do bring them outside, though, you've got to deliver. That's and that sounds like it really delivered. And I love the the way that um, you know there's the sense of um, a different technology from a different time. And um, I love that line um, uh, where you talked about um, your family and the line out of antiquity. And I think some of those things are uh, a little bit at play in um, the poem I'm going to read, which is called Endling, um, which the I guess you don't necessarily think of a, an animal as a character um, per se, but this is a poem that's about um, the extinction of a species. And mm -hmm. the title of the poem, Endling, refers to the ecological term for the creature that's recognized as the last of its line. Um, and so there's an element of, of mourning in this poem. And there was a Northern white rhino named, who was the last male um, um, named Sudan, who was in, a, um, in um, a sanctuary in Kenya under guarded, you know, armed guard protection um, against poaching because the illegal trade in rhino horns has, has decimated. Um, and, and also in trophy hunting has decimated um, the species. And so photographs of that um, had circulated online for a number of years and it's such a, it was such a striking image. Um, but unfortunately, um, the creature did die um, in, um, Sudan did die in March of 2018. And I had written this poem several years before um, that event. And I was thinking about the images of rhinos that appeared um, on cave walls and on um, African rock paintings and the way they had captured the sort of majesty um, of these creatures um, and um, contrast that a little bit with the, um, the uh, caches of um, captured, um, horns and things like that, that they've managed to um, discover. So this is called Endling. Kin to the antic animal grazing the eras of ogred lines that roams fair grottos, discreet galleries, 
It speaks a language guarded by gunmen, the last of its kind and still reserve among thickets of acacia trees. Durer dressed this exotic in swashbuckling plates, a legendary likeness of Colosseum combat. From our vantage of close-up lenses, flickering screens, this beast is wide, muzzled, all bristly hide, gaze trained low on grassland to roam by day and up to half the night. Another click offers up a cache of tagged poached horn, hoarded for elixirs and curatives, a planet's digitized requiem. A wallower, pale warship in silty waterholes linger a while beneath Kilimanjaro's visible enchantment of snow, a face caught in the crosshairs of going and gone. Uh, that's one of my favorite of, favorites of Jane's recent work. Of course, I'm very lucky because I always get to see these poems when they're they're fresh off the uh, printer, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, and and I'm just very fortunate to have a, a front row seat to all of this beautiful work that that Jane's been producing really for so many years. Well, thank do, you, do, Jane. Do you? Um, I, I I have a very close friend who is my my first best reader. And I've learned over the years um, to let to let the newest work cool <laughs> overnight, and, and and not until the next day do I think whether to send it to him or not. Mm. So, do you have a policy like that, or does Ned see things literally while the ink's still wet? <laughs> well, the the printer um, that that we share is like right behind Ned on the table right behind him. So uh -oh, yeah, I see it. things <laughs> out um, and he happens to be around, he might he might find it. So sometimes I have to print things out and and sort of save them and let them simmer for a little bit. But often I, I share work. Um, it, especially if it's work that I'm excited about or work that I have questions about. Um, and I really trust and value and Ned's, you know, feedback on poems, which is um, always positive um, and always honest about areas that I've, I've missed the mark, which I think is like the greatest gift that, that any you artist have that. can ask for to have. Um, yeah. that kind of um, intense and generous and dedicated um, readership. Yeah, it's a blessing when you have that kind of uh, reader, uh, reader writer relationship. They're not easy to come by. And <clears throat> I think any of us, when we have it, realize and prize it because there's so big a difference between a really good reader and fine judge of your work mm -hmm. and everybody else who is alive or will ever live. <laughs> They're really, it's just, there's nothing better than somebody that, that knows you can tell what you're going for and can tell when you've gotten it. And yeah. if you have can say so, and if you haven't can say why, um it's a wonderful thing <laughs> you need it, that yeah it's for me it's the opposite of um what it's like being a songwriter because i will write a song invariably it stays in my head until i get it down or i get to the keyboard and i might make a demo but literally the song is in my head for at least six months, nine months, sometimes almost a year before anyone else hears it. Mm. At, at which point I've already written a ton of other ones. So you completely miss that chance. And then of course, I'm not usually there when somebody hears, when I do finally make a recording, it goes out into the world and I'm not there when people hear it. Mm -hmm. So that at distance, that's the great mystery of your uh, engagement with your audience is not knowing who's out there, mm -hmm. not what they see, what they hear, what they understand, whether, whether they get what you were going for or see something that you didn't even realize was there, but which is still legitimate. All of those things can happen, but they don't happen to you directly because 
that's all going on at such a distance in time and space. Mm -hmm. So it's when you have that kind of reaction right there in the room with you when you just made something, it, it's such a precious thing. I'm glad you guys have that. It's terrific. Th th thanks, Al. That's so sweet. I was gonna. I was gonna also say it's pro it's probably not always practical for you to uh, try out songs in front of an audience before you record them or, mm -hmm. or get more serious about them. But maybe sometimes you do. Well, if I maybe had at the moment of creation, but maybe the next week or the next month. Well, here's the, here's the, what the problem has been during those years when I had working bands. There are always jazz bands. Mm -hmm. And so only rarely did we do my own songs because mm -hmm. they're written. I arrange them when I write them at the same time that I write them. And I'm writing them for a, for a soul blues band, which is a, I, and I don't have that kind of band. Mm -hmm. So the only songs I've ever done that were actually mine are the ones on the jazz side that kind of fit with you know, with the guys that I had have been working with. And lately I haven't worked at all. So it's not a, it hasn't been a practical opportunity. It's not like, for example, having your own rock band and working things out on tour before you get in the studio, which is a great thing to be able to do, but I've never experienced that. Well, it's great as you know, just having the gift of song, whether it's in words mm -hmm. or music is a, is a great gift. Well, it's just that they rattle around in your head so damn long. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't get them out. I mean, the only way I silence them is by writing something else. Mm -hmm. And so there's always, and so now I'm right at the point where we're, we're almost getting ready to mix my new record. And so now they've been create, now they are at the point where other people can hear what mm -hmm. for almost a year has only been audible to me in my mind. And that's a great, feeling absolutely um, yeah we've all probably sometimes had a few moments and we thought about the afterlife and wondered what it held and uh social media has of course maybe transformed so much of our everyday lives that maybe even our vision of the afterlife deserves some revision and uh and, <laughs> you know in writing the, the next poem uh, i was thinking gee what if the afterlife is actually almost like being on social media, maybe almost like being on Facebook. Uh, there'll be lots of people in it, uh, people we know, maybe people we don't know or kind of know, and we ourselves are there. And, and, uh, and, and I thought, well, let's just imagine, what would it be like if, if there were a social media site for the afterlife? And, and so this, this poem is called Dead Book, and it's uh, for all your post-life social media needs. Dead Book. Reluctantly, I opened an account sooner than I'd expected or desired. You won't believe how many friends I found, requests backed up. No password was required. The latest status updates bring surprises decades out of date. A few were sad. I scrolled a page absorbed. A comment rises, then descends on some eternal thread. I wouldn't say I like the conversations, although I'd feel much worse if there were none. I post replies, then wait, a slight impatience stirring. Is someone out there? Anyone? At first, I felt relieved to find my profile looked complete the moment I logged in, but why can't I update it? In a while, I'll click on help and maybe try again. I'm told the site is free and always will be. Still, I feel unsettled, slightly lost. Is nothing tangible? Who's listening, really? Why should I care if strangers like my post? Yes, there are strangers here. We're not all friends. Somehow, the long day's twilight never ends. I tap the keys. There's nothing else to do. It won't be long before I friend you too. Did we need an even more chilling version of the afterlife? Because you've given me one. <laughs> it's true. Hell takes many forms, doesn't it? it perhaps it's good that we become accustomed to it in this life so that when we cross over to the other side, uh, we'll uh, 
will uh, be able to operate more comfortably. Uh, I don't know if there's any blocking. That may actually be the problem in Dead Book. They may not allow blocking. <laughs> you know? So whoever, whoever is going to log on and say what they want to say, you may be stuck with them. Hell is other people you can't block. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That sounds like a meme, Al. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I can't lie. It's, it's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, social media is a strange thing. You know, we, we benefit from it in some ways, and it's great to be connected to allies, folks, colleagues, fellow artists, and of course, old friends. But um, it does visit obligations upon you. And, and uh, the way algorithms are manipulated uh, more and more in recent years makes you feel like, you know, you too are merely a cog in a larger machine who's being uh, harvested for the information you have and the buying power you have. Um, you know, often uh, there are so many folks I'd love to see on Facebook, unless I go searching for them, I don't see them. Um, I have to find them and wake up the algorithms. And so, you know, things like that are, are discouraging uh, about the whole matter. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a place you can really go that's free from some form of an intimidation or, and I, and I think probably I'll just end by saying the constant vigilance you have to have on social media, vigilance against, you know, attack against uh, uh, folks breaking in in some way or another, or, you know, Zoom conversations that, you know, get Zoom bombed. You know, I think that feeling of vigilance is wearying. It's one of the things I dislike about social media and wish I could change. And uh, it, it's too much like a cold war that never ends, you know? I, I think it's very well said, and in, in in to put it in chess terms, it's also it's a lot like a poison pawn. You know, it it seems so easy to take, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what lies, what happens but where, afterwards, but where it leads you, oh my! So, but I mean, that's no better reason than that to write about it because people should be aware at least of the things that you that you raise. Uh, and of course, you did it in a way that it, that's that's uh, as as fresh as as the marble slab. <laughs> as, I think you were about to say as disturbing as possible, and you bit your tongue. But <laughs> well, either is fine with me. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> well, I have to change direction a little bit here. And by the way, my screen unfroze, so I feel good about that. Yeah. Um, because I really don't know what's going to be recorded, whether it's going to be an extended period of my face blurred to unrecognizability. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but um, it snapped back while you were talking. So then I was relieved. So uh, let me make a, a, a right turn here. I was uh, reminded of this part of my life when I recently saw a, a documentary film by Frederick Wiseman called Basic Training, which was made, it came out in 1971, but it was made in the summer of 1970. And it was in the summer of 1970 that I was in basic training. So this is a poem about um, an incident that occurred during basic training uh, in which I learned something that uh, was valuable at the time. And, <laughs> because I didn't get sent to Vietnam, uh, didn't end up being even more valuable. It's called Sergeant Darden. And this poem was um, chosen by David Yezzi to, uh, um, for the new criterion a couple of years, several years back. Mm -hmm. uh, Sergeant Darden, and uh, this is Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri in July of 1970. Sergeant Darden marched us to the range. Fatigue starched blade sharp, even in the heat of a Missouri summer. Shades correct, brim of his DI hat, gently grinning. No grin in Sergeant Darden, as he taught us how to aim and fire our M16s. Most of us getting on a westbound plane in five more months. Him 
trying to get us ready who wouldn't ever, couldn't ever be. Try as he might, some of our names were still going to end up on a monument. He did the best job that we let him do and took 10 spoons of sugar in his coffee. Put your nose right up against the charging lever. Make that rear sight big. You see, expert, he barked, exhorting us. Don't mind no kick, you'll be all right. I sprawled face down and stuck my nose up tight against the metal. The rear sight close as it could get, big as a clock face. The front pin like matching hands that pointed to 630. It seemed like I couldn't miss that way. Although my nose got red and powder lingered in my nostrils. Weeks later, most of us dazed from the jungle, we saw him for the last time, his smooth face expressionless. He wished us luck, then fell us out, headed off toward the next week's crop of troops. But he walked by me close enough that I could smell the congoline above the heat and said, resigned and quiet, son, you were the only one that paid attention. <laughs> that, 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 is a, that is a touching moment <laughs> in a tough situation yeah. in a strange time. Yeah, you didn't expect a personal comment from Sergeant Darden, I'll tell you what. But um, I learned how to be a great shot. Uh, <laughs> we knew that we knew that with the rocks <laughs> there you go yeah and i and and i was lucky that i was not sent to where i had to use my being a great shot so yes. very so that, unfortunate so, so many was, were not yeah what a what a time i i knew i'm younger than you obviously uh you know something that we both know and i um gr grew up at a time when vietnam was simply a fact of life so as a kid there'd been no time in my memory when vietnam was not happening so at you know 11 12 13 you know 72 73 you know for all i knew i would end up fighting in vietnam as well myself uh, like so many of the folks i saw on screen uh i think my generation grew up with that assumption you know would this war ever end it might never end um so it, it's a scary time obviously very scary for the folks that actually were old enough to uh to be drafted or or, or, or to uh, or to protest yeah, it's another, it's a story for another day, but my group, my age group was in the first draft lottery. Mm -hmm. Wow. So oh in the middle of my senior year at Brown, they held the, the, the prime time television special at nine o'clock uh, in which they pulled the birthdays out of the drum. And we all knew that if mm. our birthday was pulled in the first half of the evening, we would gonna we would be drafted, mm -hmm. and we knew that if our birthday lasted until the second half of the evening, we knew that we were we were not going to be subject to the draft. Mm -hmm. And I haven't written the poem, so I'll tell the story very quickly. I was working in a bookstore the night of the of the show, and um, so my roommates agreed to keep track of my birthday. And um, I, I arrived in the middle of the show after work and they were up to about 120 or so. And my roommate said, no, they haven't, they haven't pulled your birthday yet. So I watched and watched and we got to 180 and then past 180 and I felt very good. Mm -hmm. And then as, as we, they got to the end of it, I was struck by the by the unlikelihood that my birthday might be the very last one pulled. Mm -hmm. And then they pulled the last one and it wasn't my birthday. And then they did a recap and it turns out my birthday had been picked number 22 and my friends missed it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I had about an hour and a half of thinking that I was free. My gosh. Yeah, it was an interesting evening. <laughs> Jane, your dad was in the service during Vietnam and, and actually ended up in the first Gulf War as a reservist, no? 
Right, right. He was There's a good not... deal of Jane's book, Apocalypse Mix, is about, uh, I guess, the the war economy, the the culture of war, the military industrial as, as a daughter of a serviceman. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's. I've written a little bit about it, not not as uh, not as much as as I could have, mm -hmm. but. Uh, but anyway, that's as it turns out, Frederick Wiseman's film, even though it chronicles what was going on just to state away at the same time that I was in training, is strangely uh, not that much like what I experienced. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's that would be a question for the director. To you, answer. Probably really, you probably really like Yusuf Kaminaka's work because of all the uh, yeah. poems about jazz and, and the service. Who's this? Yusuf Kuminyaka. I don't know him. Oh my gosh, you have to know his work. Email, so, me, email, so... me, email me the name. Sounds yeah, great. Yusuf There's a wonderful poem called Facing It, which um, has sort of taken on a life of its own, which is about, you know, his encounter as a veteran going to look at um, the Vietnam War Memorial and seeing yeah. his, you know, face reflected back and the people who were behind him and encountering names of those he served with. Um, I'd love to read that because I've been to the wall and I know there are names of most of the guys I trained with 80 to 85 percent went to Vietnam uh, because I was a National Guard uh, person. And because Massachusetts did not volunteer their National Guard units, I didn't go. But I know the people I trained with, there are names on that wall and I've been to the wall and I've looked. But there are so many names. Right. No, absolutely. That, so, that, but that, that sounds like something I'd very much like. So please send me the name. And actually, um, I, I talk about one of his jazz poems in the review that covers your book solo. Oh, great. I, I, so, so if you take it, and I cover so many poems in it, it's probably easy to miss mm -hmm. on reading it you know, once or twice. But I also include at the end of that review, and this is on liter their Literary Matters website, the current issue, yep. uh, the uh, link to that poem online, which will also allow you to get a link to more material on use of Kaminyaka. So terrific, so, thank you. Yeah, so also check out the other links at the end of the review because uh, there might be other stuff you, you want to discover or take a look at. Excellent. I have not, I, I, I skimmed the review and that allowed me to send you that one note, but I, I really want to go back and go through it. I mean, carefully. I published a review and you just skimmed it. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> what is it? It's only like 8,000 words or 9,000 words. You couldn't make the time. I'm <laughs> just joking. <laughs> I think. No, I intend to read it uh, exactly. No, as, no, I'm just, I'm as just closely, joking around. I will read it as closely as it deserves. Our work in our lives. <laughs> no, don't worry, I'm going to read it. But, but that sounds great. Um, yes. Well, um, so where, where were we? I think isn't isn't uh, Jane next? That sounds right. Yeah, um, and um, this poem um, takes place. It's from the book that Ned mentioned, Apocalypse Mix, which came out in in twenty seventeen. And um, my dad was in the service, and my mother is British, um, lived in England, in a small town called Corby, and her family had originally come. Um, from Ireland by way of Scotland over years of immigration. And so I have um, a dual citizenship, but one thing that they give you um, is um, something called a certificate of birth abroad for an American citizen, um, which my dad, when I was um, 21, gave to me and said, don't ever lose this. <laughs> you will lose your life if you lose this. And it, as fate turned out, my I was living in the UK when I had my daughter. Um, and so um, I had to file for a request. I had to file a request for certificate of birth abroad for an American citizen for her before we could fly her back home. Um, and so this poem takes place at the US Embassy in London in two different time periods. It's um, it's 1995 when I'm filing this request for the certificate of birth abroad for an American citizen on behalf of my infant daughter. And in, then in 2011, 
um, during a moment of silence on 9-11-2011, uh, protesters set an American flag on fire. And the poem's about an encounter um, with a Muslim woman who just um, on the street while I'm waiting outside with a pram is just reaching out woman to woman um, in, in a very um, quiet, quiet moment. Um, so this is triptych. I had a day's underground pass, forms to be filed for your passport. Soon we'd fly back to the States if your paperwork was in order. Your father stood watching the embassy, ready to call us in when needed, while I wheeled you round the garden in summer's equatorial heat. I sifted the sunshade over your face. Down the path, a stranger neared, shopping bags in her hand, headscarf adorned with flowers, petals scattering light and dark. In this time before fear was everywhere, what was the reason she caught my gaze? Nearly two decades on, my screen flickers with images of crowds and crusades, flags set aflame, placards facing off outside the same American embassy, Afghanistan's the graveyard of soldiers. If you want Sharia, move to Saudi. Rage tilts toward extremes. Citizens are advised to review the worldwide caution, stay current with media coverage. The camera pans across the roiling crowd, one side against the other, Londoners who banish all immigrants, Muslim protesters garbed in white. How to speak of what we share, what separates us. If there's a woman in that crowd, I don't see her, but I remember the day I waited with the pram, how you blinked as I pulled back the sunshade and you tugged your tiny bonnet, fist clenched unfurling, in time's reflecting pool, water gathers, builds to spill. That stranger, alone, hesitant, reached in to touch your face. What was her past? A dream of mosquito nets, acoustic flashings of rain, the cardamom pod she bought for her mother. She saw a mum with a pram and neared, touching the face of a stranger's baby, smiling as she said, beautiful, as she said, blessed. No, that's such a lovely poem. Yeah. It was such a remarkable moment um, to have. Um, but of course, um, one very beautiful thing about um, the human race is that that babies are um, sort of great levelers. Um, people reach out to babies and connect with mothers. Um, and, and I think that was an example of, of that moment. And, and I was a very quiet, very shy person. Um, and I was astonished when I was having my daughter, how many people, um, there, there seems to be this sort of cultural investment um, in a baby and a mother. Um, and it would be wonderful if that, that energy was translated in, in more powerful ways to, to support women and to support um, to, to support them long after birth and to support children um, throughout their lives, certainly. Well, this is, uh, this is a moment in history when that wish is, if anything, greater than it's, than it's been in a, in a very long time. Um, it's tough to be a mother with a baby and parts of the world right now. Yeah. Absolutely. There are, there are too many examples to, to even start to go through them. You know, what, whether it's war, poverty, you know, here in America, abroad, Ukraine, you name it. It's just, it is so awful. It's true. And yet what Jane just said is also true, that there mm -hmm. is, that there is this, this drive to, to, to connect, to acknowledge, you know, it, to help that, that everybody shares. Mm -hmm. And yet at the very same time, simultaneously in another place with, an, with another group of people, um, the, the, the impulse of humans to separate and divide and ignore mm -hmm. is just as, is is just as universal and and more deadly and potent unfortunately yeah it is life against death i mean this is um 
this is where we always find ourselves, but sometimes the, the contours stand out. But that's a lovely moment, and thank you for bringing it to this to these proceedings. Great. Um, uh, I don't remember what 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 your next one is likely to be, Ned. Have you chosen? I'm not. I'm not sure myself. <laughs> I'll just have to choose now. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how many poems are left there, Al. I don't want to. You know, this might help me to make that choice. This is round decisive. four. So you've got this one and one more. Okay, this one and one more. Okay, good. Well, maybe I'll read something personal too, um, a little more serious. Um, I think the poems I've read so far have had a serious undercurrent, but this one is sort of more, more overtly so, more overtly personal. Um, you can actually find this uh, online at The Common. And the nice thing about looking for it online at The Common, which is a, a very fine literary journal of poetry, editor John Hennessy, a very fine poet as well. But the, uh, they wanted a visual uh, along with it. So the photo that this poem is about, is, which it's is an old family photo for early in the 20th century, um, is, is also there online. Although I might have added a figure or two into the um, uh, poem that aren't actually in the photo. Um, this is uh, about my mother's family. I had mentioned uh, that I was adopted earlier. I actually am the uh, birth child of, of my mom, Elizabeth's half sister. Um, and both Elizabeth, my uh, uh, adoptive mom, and my birth mom, Elaine, um, are the daughters of a woman named Stella, who was a Polish immigrant in the early uh, tw uh, 20th century, born in 1894. And in this photo, um, which is explained in the poem pretty clearly. Uh, Stella and the kids uh, at that time are all posed in a, a, a mock-up of, of an old car, probably a Model mm -hmm. T, um, for the purpose of a photograph, probably taken you know, at some you know, waterfront resort area, maybe Atlantic <laughs> City or somewhere on <laughs> Long Island at the beach. So something sure. like that. Um, and so, uh, but the poem is also about what comes after the photo and the lives that follow the children. And, and it's also about how in looking at these photos with my mom who raised me, Betty, Elizabeth, telling me about them and about the people, you carry the feelings of the person who's showing you the photo and of the history that they've had that you've never experienced personally into the photo and into your own feelings about the photo and into your own memory of the photo. Um, so it's sort of a borrowed memory. Um, so this is called Stella's Children Look Out from a Photo Faded Gold, and it is a villanelle. No matter where you vanished, you're vanished still. Astonished, pointing out your childhood face, whatever I felt, I know I always will remember your words. That's me. The car was full, prop model T, three boys, two girls, your mother's trace of a cold smile vanishing. Vanishing still, that bygone era, pale and possible, in the grim-faced, slow exposure photos glazed to gold. What I feel now, I always will, displaced. Gently, you spoke. The silent reel that carried your memory forward brought no grace, no matter. When you vanished, you vanished. Still, I see them through your eyes, Eddie's motorcycle blasted in war, Henry's shell-shocked gaze, who knows what his captors did. Al's loss of will in a bottle's presence, living in basement rubble, even Vera, whose loss refused all solace. No matter when they vanished, they're vanished still. Whatever you felt, I felt, and always will. Mm -hmm. I really love the way that captures that um, beautiful that that sense of um, the way that we respond to to photographs and the way in which um, they become part of part of our own memories um, and the way in which other people's stories overlay um, those memories and. Um, I had a conversation with my mother recently where she was saying like, I can't remember, was I in the bomb shelter or was I hearing people talk about the bomb shelter? Mm. Um, and I think that's the same kind of effect that you, you capture so beautifully in the form of, of that, that poem. 
Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting thing to to hold a borrowed memory, um, to keep with some of the themes that have been emerging. Um, Henry, my mother's brother, was a captor of, of the uh, Germans, a prisoner of war, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly did not return uh, a man uh, who you'd you know run into you know hail well met in the street. He was certainly marked by it, and. Uh, uh, it was very strange because he and his brother Al uh, lived in the same house, the house that had been their father's house, the father that Stella left um, many, many years before um, and who continued to live in that house alone till his death. After he died, the two brothers lived there and Al, who was unfortunately an alcoholic, very seriously so, would, would kind of wander in and out and indeed was living in the basement. My mom and I used to um, head over and occasionally drop cans of food to him. Um, and uh, near the end of his life, after a stroke, we actually uh, cared for him uh, uh, and uh, and arranged for him to be in the nursing home where we visited him several times a week. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, th there's always a lighter side. Uh, and, and, and Eddie, who sadly um, also fought in the Canadian military, and I'm not quite sure why I have to look into that through Ancestry and other resources. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, was uh, uh, someone who died, you know, uh, in, in the war and is buried in the UK. Uh, but um, my mother um, had a lifelong subsequent fear of motorcycles and said, I don't want you ever riding a motorcycle. They're so dangerous. You know, you know, and I was I, I say the motorcycles are dangerous. All the way. That's how my brother died. They dropped a bomb in him when he was on the motorcycle. I'd be like, like, mom, you know, it's, it's not the <laughs> motorcycle that killed him was the bomb. If he was not a motorcycle, they would have blown him up anyway. But um, uh, my, my suspicion is that there's much more to the story. And one very touching thing, I, I actually have some of uh, Ed's you know, letters to Betty, um, which were um, delivered to the family after he had died in the war. Um, and uh, some of them are very touching as he's trying to, to write to his family. And, and uh, uh, obviously they didn't arrive, I think, before his death, but they did you know, uh, eventually get to the family. So in any case, family, war, it's a, it's a complicated world. Yeah, how all of these, all of these pieces from our past somehow work together to contribute to our own sense of identity mm -hmm. is endlessly fascinating. Um, and you've got a more complicated story you know, than, than some mm -hmm. going back. But the fascination of what a photo affords you, which is a, a thread, you mm -hmm. know, a, a link that sometimes you can follow back to the reality of that person's life, which is what's very strong, strongly represented in, in this poem. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. just reminds me of that of that power of the power that that what we can reclaim from the threads that trail you know that that led up to us uh and how much that can mean to us even though we only know a little bit what we can get from the little bit that we can know it means so much to us but, absolutely you know poetry and writing and, and literature in general music too you know, they're often you know ways of reclaiming memory, absolutely in heritage, and and the people from our past that disappear, who become mm -hmm. sometimes the characters in what we write yeah. or sing. Uh, well, sure, it directs your there. imagination. I mean, because we have an imagination, we can try to recreate the lives of the people that came before us, um, and it's that's a capability that not not everybody has. And so uh, uh, it's a temptation that's hard to resist because we can go go into those lives and feel that we can that we can flesh them out and make mm -hmm. them present and real, and um, and for us they are. And then we can write things that echo for the for the listeners as well. So you're right. That particular poem is a personal one for you, um, in a way that the Invisible Man is not, because that's some, that's an image that we all shared equally. Mm -hmm. But it threads the needle back to the way that we all operate with our own past. So it's I I I 
take it very personally as well, even though my story has got all of these aunts and uncles that had divergent paths and people that didn't talk about the war, et cetera. So thank you. Nice. Um, well, I, my last poem is going to speak to that part of the theme of character, but the one that I'm going to read now is uh, a good deal more, uh, uh, it's based on a public event, but which had a very private uh, impact <laughs> for me <laughs> at my expense, but I deserved it. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, in 1968, uh, had you been uh, probably a little older than, than you guys are, you would have noticed that college campuses were completely overrun by the public publication uh, by New Directions mm -hmm. of uh, Borges' uh, Labyrinths and then later Ficciones. Uh, it, it, Borges blew up, so to speak, in 1968, if you happen to be in college or university. And at the same time, I was fortunate to be at Brown because he came to speak at Brown. And so I got to see him speak, a comment that he would not have been able to make himself. Um. I, just, I just wanted to quickly uh, apologize. Uh, suddenly my, my, my daily and unpredictable virus uh, uh, update just kind of popped up and started immediately scanning. And before I could turn it off, it had finished its scan. Sorry about that. I didn't see it. Oh, I, I thought it, it made a tone that might be audible. Mm -hmm. Ding. Not to, not to me. <laughs> so, 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 well. so that's great. So, so Borges blew up. Okay, so Borges blows up, and then uh, he comes to Brown to give a talk. So, in fact, it was interesting that he gave it in the amphitheater in the in the uh, physics building, and. Um, I had recently stopped being a physics major, so I knew my way around the amphitheater and the physics building quite well. This is called Encounter with Borges, Brown University, 1968. Mm -hmm. And I had read a little bit of Borges, but I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, duh. <laughs> Encounter with Borges. Looking by a hanging cheek and lengthened jowl uncannily like my Aunt Sue though older, he made his way stoop-shouldered and infirm, or so it seemed, relying on a younger arm, deliberate in little steps, afforded by the crowd a monarch's time in getting down the amphitheater's aisle. We were in school, freshly in love with fame as we had redefined it. He was flush. The currency of new directions ran high in the college bookstore, and that year his labyrinths had broken like a wave across the shelves. Mad to encounter greatness in person for the first time, we were patient. The better to imagine us alone, I sat down front, unnoticed others at my back. As he maneuvered carefully behind a massive desk, supported by one hand, the other reaching for his chair, he gazed out and it seemed to me, regarding the several hundred of us far and near, he settled on me as the last. Then, dipping alertly in his jacket, he produced a pocket watch, old-fashioned gold, and set it on the desktop just by his right hand. He began his talk of literary things, his voice unhurried with the placid tone of one who, after a meticulous and lifelong search, arrives at certainty. I don't remember what he said, because while bathing in the moment, I was warmed by the persistent sense that while he spoke to all of us, his eye was fixed on me. <laughs> I'd heard of the performer's trick to focus on one face in the crowd to conquer nerves. It made sense that his eyes, trained as they were to words that slipped away like fish, despite their being pinned in text to pages, found so many hidden histories and faces too much. Better to simplify and rest on one, letting his sympathetic features bear for all the freight 
of human contact. I took this further. Wasn't I a writer too? New minted, my identity susceptible, read destiny in all the terms of the encounter. The applause I half heard and acknowledged as the end of the event came from outside the bubble. Within, Borges and I were sealed and fated. The proof lay in his gaze, unwavering. And then his head immobile still and pointed at me. His right hand flopped against the desk once, twice, three times, then settled on the watch and brought it up to his right eye. An inch away, he peered intently at its face. New to the court, I hadn't been informed before the feast how blind the king might be. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I might have been the only person in the room that, that didn't know that Borges was, could barely see. <laughs> but um, I... Uh, there, there was a great fall then. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful moment though. You know, yeah. uh, I think when you're young and you're looking for connection with someone who's, uh, if not an actual mentor, but, but a, a celebrity, a celebrated yeah. person in his or her field, you're so excited to be in their company. You're hoping that, you know, some moment of interest, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you, you're a, you're a, you're a, poem about Cootie speaking to him backstage yeah, you know, about the plunger yeah. for the for the uh, trumpet is another one of those encounters someone you admire you you want you know and we all do this when we're young you know you want to you meet this person that practices your art or uh, whether it's literary like mm -hmm. Borges and and uh, perhaps sure. disappointing but, um, but who knows maybe he saw more than than you knew maybe there was I don't something think so. blur <laughs> that was comforting all I know is that whatever vestige of vision was there Nah, not for the first and not certainly not for the last time that ego balloon was burst. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't burst it. That was a very fine poem. <laughs> well, it was a memorable moment and mm -hmm. uh, you had to be there. Uh, it, it wasn't you enough for there. you. To, you just put us there. You had to be me there, I guess <laughs> it's more, more to the point. But anyway, um, so... All right, we, we're now entering the uh, the final stage. So what do you have for uh, for your last poem, Jane? Okay, so this one is another one from Apocalypse Mix. Um, and it is um, uh, references a speech um, that was written for Elizabeth II. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, every so often, the British National Archives um, releases confidential files to the public, and um, a number of years ago, probably within the past five years, um, they released a speech that was written for Elizabeth II um, to be read on, in the event of the announcement of World War III. Um, so, there is a recording online at the BBC of an actor reading the speech because Elizabeth had has not read that speech. Um, and so this is about my discovery of the speech. And it's also a little bit about um, Queen Elizabeth in her early days um, when she did her first recording, um, which was um, when she was relatively young, it was 1940, and she was addressing um, children um, in England and throughout the Commonwealth who were on the home front dealing with the Blitz and others who were dealing with um, different events in their country and the knock-on effects um, of the Second World War as it reverberated across the globe. So this is called um, On Listening to Elizabeth II's Secret World War III Speech. When I listen online to a doomsday speech revealed 30 years on from a Cold War scenario, there's not a whiff of the archive's musty air. In a live stream across the Atlantic, an actor delivers words not from the Queen's own hand, the script for a monarch schooled in disaster, 
Yet the speech still seems canonical in its call to family and duty, to memory and shared inheritance, the same mix of sorrow and pride recalled from nursery days where waiting by the wireless one September day, a princess not yet a teen heard her father announce war's onset. Within three years, she'd record her first speech, a broadcast to the Commonwealth's children, those living with gracious hosts from their homes and those nearer who'd weather the blitz, full of cheerfulness and courage, trying to do all we can to help our gallant sail sailors, soldiers, and airmen, and trying, too, to bear our own share of danger and sadness and war. Still years from the crown, she was already thinking of peace as work that falls to the young. But flash forward to the weeks, storied and between seasons, where the warmth of hearth and home, yuletide and good cheer might have given way. The panic of air raids and conscripted soldiers, the population in panic as long range missiles approach, as embassies pooled their shuttered dark in the face of what's mad and mutually assured destruction, cities in ruin, topography scraped off the map in the broadcast that never took place. Mm. So when I was goodness. working on this, the, the idea of you know, Cold War scenarios seemed um, perhaps a little archaic. Um, I no longer found it very <laughs> moving to revisit to revisit that poem and it's um the necessity for um that speech is it's just mind-boggling growing up as i did in the 50s when uh the whole idea of uh, you know a nuclear armageddon was was in our in our minds all the time and as a nine or ten year old i would have dreams of looking out the window of my bedroom and seeing Soviet bombers in close right. formation dropping. I could see the, the doors open and the bombs falling. This is the kind of dreams I had. Mm -hmm. um, but not until, I, not until I, I, I saw your poem, Jane, had I ever thought about the implications for someone like Elizabeth to make that kind of an announcement. I, I, what an extraordinary thing to ask, to, to, to require of, of, a, of a head of state to say something to people about to be destroyed. Uh, I'd like, I mean, you put me one square away from the actual text of the speech Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, she never actually gave the speech. And the I, speech, the speech is available um, on online. Like the her speeches are available. Like I in the poem I quoted from her 1940 broadcast, which you can find at the archives. But um, this speech was also read on the um, BBC News UK politics. So um, mm -hmm. it's easy to, to sort of access and see what that's like. And of course, people probably remember if you've seen The Crown, um, which brings that, you know, um, conflation of the the queen as a person and the queen as a public figure and states person um you know in in collision in interesting ways um you might remember that the queen usually routinely does christmas speeches right and so it's cast in 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 that light the this the mm -hmm. doomsday speech but wow. it's pretty pretty it is i think you're right that it's absolutely chilling to think that um, you know, certainly in our country, we always think about the question, who's going to answer the phone call at 3 a.m., right? That's kind of the way we, we think about who will deliver the message, who carries the, the suitcases, right? Um, the briefcases with the bombs. And yeah. um, we have to go about so much of our lives, like not thinking about those things. And every once in a while, there's something that really um, triggers the realities. Um, well, that's that, something that, that struck me about memory. it. And I, she, she seems to me to be such a dutiful person. She must have practiced it. And can you imagine that this would be an interesting little dramatic moment? 
Can you imagine being her trying to work out just how to read that message mm. in advance so that you're prepared? Wow, just extraordinary. I mean, I love to hear poems about things that I've never ever imagined before. So this filled the bill really nicely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One of my oh. favorites. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've never seen a, a, a I've never seen another poem anything like it in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of the the subject matter, the theme, this the stance, all of that. It's 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 nice. This is why we write, I hope it's why we write poems, is to make something that's not like anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> well, you got to follow that, Ned. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't, I don't expect to uh, in any way equal it. I'll just have to uh, take a different tack. You know, it's like a, a well-constructed album. You know, you go from the uh, a song that's just an extraordinary, you know, a, a, a magnum opus to a, to a complete change of pace. And this way you're not competing with it. Um, but it's a, a beautiful, beautiful poem. Hey, I'm going to actually read a a, a poem from my first book. So this is a much older uh, poem. And, uh, and it's called Galileo's Banquet, Saturi's Bliss. Mm. And I, I'll close with this because I, I think it's a poem that has a, uh, it has a good feeling in it. And, and, and Galileo, we know, of course, uh, was a person of vision. We know about his telescope. We know he was uh, 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 certainly singled out by the Catholic Church for uh, uh, you know, uh, views that were heretical. And I, and I think the thing I like about this uh, uh, poem subject, you know, because I didn't invent the subject, uh, is, is that it, uh, it's called Galileo's Banquet, Saturi's Bliss. This is about a banquet. And the, and the epigraph says, at the end of March 1611, <laughs> Galileo went to Rome. You're, you're, you're a, a favorite place, Al. <laughs> Yeah. to induce the ecclesiastical authorities to look through his telescope. So here's mm -hmm. a telescope. Come on, you know, uh, ecclesiastical authorities. Come on, you clerics. Come on, you priests. Look through it. It's okay. On April 4th, 1611, he was invited to an important banquet. And this is in his, uh, Henry King's History of the Telescope. So at this banquet, uh, Galileo is being honored, but it's narrated not by Galileo, but by a guest named Saturi, who I also ran across in the, in the source text, who was admiring of what's happening and knows that he's at the presence of this epoch changing <laughs> event and his restrained excitement about it his admiration for being present at this extraordinary moment and also even his sort of very human awareness of some of the um, underhanded politics and subtle competitions among some of the guests uh, I think is a uh, uh, something that struck me to make me want to write this poem. It's in two sonnet stanzas, Galileo's Banquet, Saturi's Bliss, and it's Saturi who was speaking. And Al, by the way, thanks for having us. This has been a lovely second time around uh, and, and always a joy. Galileo's me Banquet, too. Saturi's Bliss. <laughs> the banquet held in Galileo's honor began at sunset when we all took turns recovering each word of an inscription carved above a door a mile away. <laughs> Amazed, we feasted. Rising after dinner, we stood in line again to see the burns that marred the moon's thin crescent, and the sky mm. grew darker still, dense clusters of small stars becoming visible, as if the sun had touched them with its light before it fled. I stepped aside, glanced down, and saw small fires burning below through trees. I ate some bread, a clear night without clouds, the ideal weather. We did not gladly yield our places either. This we shall call a telescope, declared Prince Frederick, our host. I was impressed till I discovered that another man, the poet Demisiani, had coined the word, how typical. I'd learned this from La Gala in his justly famous lunar phenomena, not from the gossip of some other guest. On the night that he unveiled his invention, once we'd had our fill of Jupiter, 
all four of its satellites and each star the prince named for himself, Galileo dismantled his creation. The moon's advance across the sky at last had brought it low. I waited for my turn to hold the lens. Wow. I'm just so glad that we managed to increase our audience by one <laughs> while that poem was being read. Not Clearly everybody is it, saying, not everybody's going to know what you're been... talking about. You, he you was have so to excited when he heard you. He started, <laughs> he jumped up. You're saying, Mommy and Daddy, you've been looking at that desk window for so long. <laughs> you know, how, what about me? I woke up, I come first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that waving tail. <laughs> well, um, I saw an ad a couple of days ago on television for a new show called uh, 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 Here You Are, I think it's, it's called. <laughs> and what it reminded me of was a show from the 50s that I saw when I was a small child when television was new called You Are There. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the poem that you just read, it really, it puts me there. Oh, thank you. It really, it, uh, it has a very, very um, seamless kind of authority to it that it makes me think that you were there. Well, well, well uh, perhaps the credit goes to the, uh source material uh, that I read so many years ago and which included some lovely details like the ones I borrowed and a few that I invented um, as I thought about it. So- Yeah, I you still have to synthesize of, it. I think a lot of us, when we write, we have little movies in our heads tumbling out as we see what happened and hear what took place. And certainly in even the poems that I write where something is entirely fictionalized, I, I have one of those little movies and again, in this case, I think you know the credit also goes to the source material. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and I thought it was so fabulous the way there's the description of like seeing the the names in the yes. doorway across the street and the um, little you know features of the moon, and those are sort of timeless. Um, you know, sort of spottings that that children love when they get their first mm -hmm. telescope, right? It's like that's looking true. at the features on the moon. I think that's such a yeah. It's time. really grounded in in the 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 magic yes of the power <clears throat> of and and you you try to imagine at that point in human history what an utterly novel thing it was mm -hmm. to have any object with that kind of power. I mean, we live surrounded by, you know, miraculous devices that do unimaginable things, and we grow very, you know, very jaded. But to have even seen a lens in 1611, mm -hmm. most people in their entire lives had not even seen a lens, much less seen what it could do. So it's, that's just, you know, it's, it's very, uh, very cinematic. I feel like I can see and hear and, and, and feel the atmosphere. And, and that's, you know, it's a wonderful gift to have to be able to give to others that, that you can quarry out a piece of experience and give it to them, especially if it's one you didn't have. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, I'm not the only one to point out that if all you do is write about the things that have happened to you and the things you've seen, uh, the material can run a little dry and, and you know, at some times <laughs> and, and you want to find ways to, to look at things from a new perspective so that when you return to your own perspective and your own memory, it's uh, uh, not just the same old, same old, you know, so uh, and maybe that's what this whole theme today about character is all about, being able to look mm -hmm. at other people, but also look through the eyes of other people, whether they're real or whether they're imagined, and see yeah. the world differently, as well as see it maybe the same world, but with a different perspective. Yeah, and it's been a nice, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's a sense of rescuing history. You know, you're rescuing the voices of history and rec uh, rescuing moments. Um, it's 
So I think that's one of the, the sort of themes that emerge as you think about characters, you're thinking about um, greater brush strokes to the sparse timeline that we usually see when we look at the historical record. Well, that's certainly the direction that um, that we've ranged through in the course, you know, in the course of 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 the talk. Um, I have kept personally to things that did happen to me, um, but I'm going to end with something that's going to build a little bit on Ned's one poem removed about the photograph with all the relatives, mm -hmm. because this is a poem that, that dwells on the ultimate mystery of character, that you can be very close to people and be around them to the point that they become very familiar to you, and yet they can be carrying a mystery that is completely hidden from you, impenetrable to you, and maybe in fact to basically everyone else. And so this is this is really about um, uh, one of my mother's cousins. And um, the story is contained in the poem, as is the mystery. And when we reach the end, we don't know any, all we know more of is the question. We really know what the question is, but we don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. And this is called, and so I end with a question about the character, but it's also a question posed to the listener um, because we are all characters. So oh, none of one, nobody I know is quite like this particular character. And I knew this woman in my childhood um, as much as you could know her. Uh, it's called The Unforgivable. Something happened on her honeymoon. The Unforgivable. A day or two, a week at most, she showed up back at home, never to speak of what she'd been put through. Living again with parents and her sister with no thought of annulment or divorce, she kept her husband's name until she died and bitterness and shame had run their course, but not one day before. The way she spoke his name in conversation gave it chill, laced with contempt, familiarity, and helpless hanging on the words that kill. I was her cousin's son, born in what would have been the time of her own children's birth, and I was prized each Sunday after mass out of all proportion to my worth. Fed the precious saved up delicacies, torone nut and nougat, hard to chew but not to be declined. And sugar iced egg cookies, chocolate mint pan candy too, all too sweet by half. When I was older, it was anisette and fresh pizzelles. <laughs> Still soft and bendable, warm from the iron. Gifts lavished on me so as to compel my sitting still for those two single sisters. One knotted up by marriage all too brief. The other four foot six and hunchbacked thought fit only for the convent. What relief their substitute affections could provide them, I never knew. But they were always kind despite all the demands of their devotion. I kept the unforgivable in mind. What could have soured the new bride on her man so thoroughly she never could let go, yet never could accept? The mystery was deep. Even my mother didn't know. When I was old enough, my father took me to the barber shop. Amid the smell of tonic and vitalis, clipping hair, men's talk, and quiet with his clientele stood the man in question, plain and trim, with black rim glasses and a patient air, adjusting the position of a head, applying gentle pressure, 
here and there. In short, he didn't fit the storyline. Unlikeliest of monsters, he was tame, which only brought me back to the dilemma of what he'd done for what he was to blame. So here's the rub. Was he a specimen of vileness out of mind, so well concealed he bore no single trace of evil nature until in secret it could be revealed behind the closed door of the bridal chamber? Or was his sin common in man and wife, grown monstrous in the eyes of one who'd led much to her grief, a far too sheltered life? Might we judge she was too sensitive, her hopes disgorged, too quick to run away and settle for a life in opposition to the absent one who come to stay? We will never know the truth of this. All principles are dead, all secrets kept. What is the unforgivable to you? What in and of itself can't you accept? Well, that's a great question. I'm, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> many of us have pondered it at times. You don't have to answer. <laughs> that's a, 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 a wonderful sketch of, 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 of lonely folks of another generation in another time yeah very touching and 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 yeah it, it was a time too when, when people that had a physical difference were really just you know completely dismissed and completely dehumanized uh we can all remember how people spoke about them yeah only in the church was there a place for that for that right uh great great cousin um and did she, she on? no, but but she and her sister did endless work at the at the mm -hmm. parish church, right. which was just around the corner from their house, and there was a place for them there. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was such a, a so many others, because um, there were a lot of relatives that lived mm -hmm. in a five block area between my grandparents' house and the church that we went to, and we would have to visit every one of them on the way after back after church it took all day to get back from mass <laughs> mass got out at 10 o'clock but we didn't get home till five yeah. so we would see all of these people and and with the with the exception of these two sisters they had all had more or less conventional lives they'd married mm -hmm. had children um but these two and boy when my mother brought me there there, there were no more kind, um, you know, uh, uh, considerate, generous mm -hmm. people. But there was behind all of that, this tremendous, there was this pressure from the sheer need yes. that they had. And, and I understood very early on that um, I was there for them. Mm -hmm. you know and and so I always try and that the main role that I had was to accept what they wanted to give me mm -hmm. yeah and that's you not know? unusual in, in Italian relatives I certainly know my own dad's family yep. uh but then this sounds like it was reinforced and, and doubled or tripled with these two lonely folks well the one who had been married was an object of complete mystery to my mother because mm -hmm. they were cousins and no, under no circumstances mm -hmm. was my mother ever able to find out what happened. It mm -hmm. kind of drove her a little nuts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's also a, a kind of, um, you know, astonishing reminder of um, the, the silences that, um, you know, fall over over women's lives sometimes and the silences that are kept within families that yes. um, cause so much grief and pain and the gestures that, that people make to, to try to save themselves and the gestures of love that they show to others with the, you know, compulsive candy making and, yes. and the, the visits that are all taking place. 
um, it's just astonishing. And then you kind of counter that with the, the complete um, lack of shame <laughs> that we see on like social media, you know, no. where everything hangs out, so to speak. Well, uh, it's a com that was a completely yeah, different the cultural difference world. is just astonishing in terms of, of historical moments. Yeah, to have come from that world as as I did, I'm I'm really struck living in the contemporary world of how close those lives were to the lives of people 500, a thousand, two thousand years ago, and how we're rapidly moving away from that that whole way of being human. Yeah, but you notice what's interesting about it. I agree with you. That's a that's a great point. But the other thing I think is interesting, isn't it just sort of a a reassigning of what is a matter of shame and what is not? Right. So instead you end up being, you know, canceled on social media for a misstep, sometimes for something very serious, but it's sometimes for a misstep. Um, so there's a kind of shunning that goes on now mm -hmm. that's of a different nature. Yeah, um, and uh, and uh, there are other kinds of secrets, um, but that's uh, true. But this is and what we once treated as secrets. We now display and we're proud of. Yeah, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad because the openness is actually good. It's probably the reason that a lot of what once were crimes are you know out in the open, and you know mm -hmm. women, especially and and young folks, children, you know, uh, you know, have protections that at one point were. Well, simply not present or that were ignored or that people denied. So I'm not saying it's necessarily bad, but it is interesting how these things shift. Yeah. Yeah, the question- There's someone though that doesn't feel any shame. <laughs> this fellow here in my lap, he went from yeah. Jane to me. We have uh, to have this is appearance, <laughs> Al. It's always important to see good old Wyatt. There Wyatt's he is, see, what's up? Well, That's this is- so uh, moving to to hear about those two sisters kind of working i love know, that poem I love that. i'm glad like, i'm glad that we covered so many poems whose characters were women today yeah and that there's been such a variety of women and women's lives and women's voices and sometimes women's silences mm -hmm. yeah that were touched on uh it wasn't That's true it wasn't my intent although you were aware of today's being Women's, what is it? Say it again. International Women's Day. Yeah. This is my shame that I didn't know it was International Women's Day. Well, there's, uh, you know, to be fair. I think I better so go to social media and cancel you out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we did, we did right by the concept, uh, whether, uh, whether all of us had the intention when we began or not. And I think that's because, at least for me, um, strong women characters have been a very important part of my life. They certainly mm -hmm. were in my childhood and, and have continued to be so. And so I write about them. And it comes through very compellingly, too. How oh, well, neat. Well, uh, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know how we can possibly follow why it's uh, making it. <laughs> <laughs> making an appearance so perhaps we should uh, bring the proceedings to a close although this has been uh, it was predictably going to be great fun but then it is you're such a sweetheart <laughs> thank, thank you, so you much. well i've i've very very much enjoyed having you and uh i'm pleased that uh we've gotten through another one and uh, <laughs> we made it to the finish line yeah and i hope that uh I hope that uh, everything works out and we didn't have too much in the way of frozen screens and mm -hmm. technical glitches because the human component was rich and varied. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Al. On. It was great to chat with you. Great to yeah. have the work. Well, likewise, particularly for me, for, for you, Jane, because I, I had, and I mentioned this to Ned, I hadn't really, I'd heard you read, but I hadn't really spoken much to you. So this is, this is very welcome. Well, great. Thanks for, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Hey, all right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, end things until the next time. And thank you for being uh, who you all are. So thank long. you, Al. It's thank always you. a pleasure to talk to you and hear your wonderful poems. 
Take care. Right back at you. See ya.